question to Sean and Mike is, is, it, is everything going all right? <laughs> in general? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, to the people in the room, hello. It's really nice to see you. Uh, before I do anything else, I should thank Simon Greenall very much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful celebration. I really want to thank Steve Brent, the Chief Executive of International House London, for allowing us all to be here. And a really special thanks to Sean and Heike over there for doing their very best to make sure that the technology works absolutely fine. Um, and thanks to well, the world, really. Listen, I'm older than International House. This is a bit depressing, but but my I didn't actually I didn't actually make I didn't actually know that International House existed until I was 24. And at the age of 24, um, um, I came to this place. This is the door of 40 Shaftesbury Avenue, which is where International House set up in London. Now, this is actually before I came here, because you'll notice that the that the guys are standing there in jackets and ties, and by the time I came here, we were all hippies, and nobody wore ties or anything else like that. It was all rather cool. I've got two memories from my teacher training course in 1971, uh, and the first was, on the very first day, we had a teacher called Antus, and it turned out, as Judy may remember, I don't think his name was Antus at all, I think he was called Anthony something. Anyway, he taught us Malay, apparently, and after a, a, a lesson which lasted for about uh, 35 minutes, I was able to say, Susu Itsu Adadalam Chawanitsu, which I'm reliably informed means the milk is in the bottle. And, uh, but I've tried this out on my Malay friends, and they don't understand a word. <laughs> however, however, the point of the story is I can still remember it, and it was a long time ago. And that's really impressive to have a little lesson, you know, about 71, how many years it was ago, and still remember one of the, one of the model sentences we were taught. And the other memory I have a complete sort of recall of was, was our trainer, a wonderful woman called Georgie Raman, who was, the, who was my trainer and, and who I instantly fell into a kind of puppy-like devotion to, as so many trainees do with their trainer at the beginning, a little mud pause. And, and I remember her standing in front of our group of, of foreign students and she got them all to say with perfect timing and absolute rhythm, there were 10 in the bed and the little one said roll over and they all rolled over and one fell out. There were nine in the bed and the little one said roll over and they all rolled over and one fell out. There were eight in the bed and she did this fantastic piece of of drilling, it was absolutely extraordinary. I was so impressed. I've never been so impressed in my life by anything. And it seemed to have worked because at the end of four weeks, at the end of four weeks, I got my International Teacher Training Institute certificate. Now this is what they used to look like. And I dug it out the other day out of interest and I found some really fascinating things that it included. The first thing, and this shows you how much International House has changed in intervening years. The first thing it says is, this course was designed for English nationals, which is an interesting kind of reflection on how our profession has moved so much. And as you can see, it includes English structure and pronunciation, class techniques, the use of audiovisual aids, and the tape recorder, <laughs> and an introduction to the language laboratory. Oh yes, and the Buckingham and the language laboratory. And the one or two people in the room will remember that, get that reference. A considerable proportion of the course consisted of teaching practice with foreign students. So there's my International House, well, it was the International Teacher Training Institute certificate, uh, signed by <coughs> Lynn Williams and John Haycraft. Um, I read little reports about what I was like as a teacher, and it says blah, 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 but unfortunately it says his pronunciation paper, however, lacked practical ideas. And this is a bit depressing, but Adrian hadn't written his book yet on pronunciation, so I can But I just want to say that whoever wrote that should be shot. There's no comma before or after, however. I'm not bitter, obviously. But, but there should be commas, shouldn't there? Um, anyway, so that's, that was my failure. And, and uh, uh, Adrian's going to give me classes later. But the other thing which interested me is blah, 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 blah. But the sentence which leapt out at me was this one. He drilled thoroughly mastering all the recommended and discussed techniques. And this is clearly a, a, a mark of approbation. This is something I could do really well, apparently. This is why I got my grade two, all right, I got my grade two certificate, because I could drill thoroughly. And it just fascinated me because uh, I was talking to Magda, I think, wasn't it, who's just this minute completed a four-week course, and it'd be interesting to know what you think of drilling, because when I did my four-week course in 1971, drilling was all the rage. 
That's what we did lots and lots of drilling, and I was good at it. I stand here before you proud, a proud driller. Uh, and so what I thought we should have a little discussion about in the 15 minutes remaining to me is I think we should talk about thorough drilling and whether you think that thorough drilling has stood the test of time in the international house uh, world that we all inhabit. Um, drilling, of course, as anyone who's ever had to read all the stuff about history of methods and all that kind of stuff, drilling, of course, is always allied in our minds with audiolingual methodology. That the constant repetition of grammatical sentences um, uh, organized by the teacher so that students won't make any mistakes or anything else like that, uh, caused the acquisition of really good habits. And those good habits allow you to be a good language speaker. Why else, after all, was the language laboratory such a huge part of International House, uh, Shaftesbury Avenue, and 106, and for all I know, uh, Stukeley Street? What was the language laboratory? Why did we have a course? Once again, there are one or two of us in the audience who will remember that. English Fast was a series of essentially audiolingual drills. Uh, uh, the language laboratory, of course, is just about the only technology ever designed to absolutely satisfy a particular methodology, a particular uh, approach to language learning. That's what it was for. We did lots of drilling in the language laboratory and lots of drilling in class. That's why Georgie said, there were ten in the bed and the little one said, roll over. I'm like, he said that before. I thought uh, I should have a look and see what... Um, the experts in the field say about drilling. And so I went and had a look at some of the more popular works of literature about teaching methodology. Uh, and I consulted, for example, this is probably the biggest uh, and most popular uh, methodology stroke applied linguistics title in the US. Uh, Doug Brown's book, uh, Principles of Language Learning and Teaching. And this is the fourth edition published in 2007. And I went to have a look to see what he had to say about drilling absolutely nothing. <laughs> ah, okay, so drilling has had it. Um, then I went and had a look at Tricia Hedges' wonderful book, which many of you will have come across, which is Teaching and Learning in the Language Classroom. And um, she had absolutely nothing to say about drilling whatsoever, or repetition in any of its forms like that. That's probably unfair. If I had read it in more detail, I might have found something. But I went through the index to see what I could find. Um, I looked at this uh, lovely book um, published, uh, written by Graham Hall, who, as many of you know, is now the editor of ELT Journal. This was published in 2012. And of course, he's, he's got it right on the nail. He says, while habit-forming activities may have a place in the ELT classroom, there have been numerous strong criticisms of the idea that habit-forming by itself offers a full explanation of how languages are learned. It fails to allow for the role of the human mind in learning of consciousness, thought, and unconscious mental processes. Um, and that, of course, is why people say they don't do drilling. Brackets. Is that true? Question mark. Bracket. So that's what he has to say. Of course, the reason that we got a bit fed up with drilling is because we started to think, we, the world, the profession, the world of language teaching, started to think that actually just repeating things endlessly and forming habits probably wasn't the way to do it. However, Judy Gilbert, the pronunciation, uh, the uh, rather wonderful pronunciation lady, she says, repetition, a truly ancient teaching method, fell into disfavor decades ago because teachers worry that it's boring. But the reality is that quality repetition is the opposite of boring because it helps students feel themselves growing in mastery. That actually, and, and I wrote a blog about this, and I had a, a, someone called Sharon Turner came onto my blog, and she said on my blog, um, she hated audiolingual drilling, it was militaristic, she didn't like it, and it was all blah, 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 blah. But then she went on to say that her Turkish husband, who was learning English as a third language, uh, went to all these communicative classes, but when no one was looking, he sneaked off to another school somewhere in London, beginning with C, I don't know what it's called. Anyway, he sneaked off to another school where they did lots and lots of drilling, because it made him feel good, and it gave him confidence, it made him feel secure, and he was happy, happy to be doing it. And wasn't that wonderful, you know? Um, Here's, um, here's, oh yes, this is a book by Jim Scribner, who, who writes really good methodology books, unfortunately. And, um, and, um, and what does he have to say about it? He says, so 
Don't worry too much about colleagues on methodology books who tell you not to bother with drills. Certainly there's some danger that students repeating are just making noise. But of all activities in the classroom, the oral drill is the one which can most productively be demanding on accuracy, or wherever you want to put the B. So he seems to be clear, and this is the 2007 edition, no, even later, I think, this is the fourth edition. He seems, he seems to have a place in his heart for, for, for drilling, the oral drill. Because you get accurate when you drill. And like Sharon Turner's husband, you feel confident when you get to do the drilling. You feel relaxed and confident. Um, of course, you know, nothing, any talk ever to do with it. I have to go to Scott's uh, A to Z blog, which is still there, even though he's now blogging about something else. But it's a brilliant resource. And when I was preparing this talk, I found something that maybe many of you know. And that is that one of the fonts that Apple offers me is a font called Thornberry. And so I've decided, that I've made a sort of little note to myself that in the future, if I ever mention Scott in a talk, I have to have all my typeface in Thornbury, because otherwise it wouldn't be fair. Anyway, so there's a, there's a, there's a typeface called, oh, shut up, Jeff. Anyway, so he did, he did this, he did this uh, um, blog about repetition, and he quoted um, uh, Claire Cramch's uh, book, The Multilingual Subject, and she says, in an effort to make language a book, well, we, Oh no, I don't know whether the people online can read it so well. In an effort to make language use more authentic and spontaneous, communicative language teaching has moved away from memorization, resuscitation, and choral response. It's put a premium on the unique, individual, and repeatable utterance in unpredictable conversation. Listen, she's saying something really, really profound, it seems to me. That the whole communicative revolution said to the teacher and the students, prioritize being creative, prioritize being original, prioritize saying new things, prioritize in the world of dogme, prioritize getting the stuff from the room, prioritize getting people to absolutely come up with stuff that's important to them. That's what we've done. That's what the whole communicative movement did. Uh, we could spend the next three or four hours talking about whether I've got that right. But there was something to do with the communicative approach which did that. And then she goes on to say, and yet, there is value in repetition as an educational device because utterances repeated are also re-signified. Their meaning is re-tooled, recreated. Utterances repeated are also utterances re-signified. Look, all you have to do, I was listening on the radio yesterday to one of Britain's uh, foremost theatre actors, a man called uh, uh, um, Alex Jennings. And he, he, made the, he made the obvious point that all actors know in the theatre, which is no audience is ever the same. Every night you get a different response from the audience. But I would go further and say that no performance is ever the same, because what happens in theatre is actors speak the same lines night after night, but every time they speak them, those lines are re-signified, full of new meaning, full of, full of new... meaning. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so... What Claire Cramp seems to be saying is that when you say things again, you're saying the same thing, but new meaning sticks and attaches itself to what you're saying. And if that is the case, so many of the things that Scott was just talking about, and my brain's gone a bit dead, but the, but the thing about their involvement, their engagement with what they're saying, if you re-signify things that you're repeating, you get just as much engagement from that, perhaps, as you do from saying wonderful, creative, and intelligent new things. And with that in mind, and to finish with, I'd like to offer you my modern take on George's 10 in the bed. Because I have a feeling that this absolutely qualifies for, oh, oh no, well, I should just say, by the way, um, um, uh, that, that of course, uh, uh, you were kind enough to mention the singing and the songwriting and the music and stuff, Simon, thank you for that. Um, music is a huge part of my, of what I do when I'm not doing this. And, and that's a page from my viola practice book. And, and uh, I gave a talk at this year's IOTEFL conference uh, about music practice and what you learn from that. Because music practice is a little bit like language learning. People repeat the same things again and again and again and again and again. But what we know about music practice is if you just play the same thing again and again and again, nothing much happens. What recent studies in the last 10, 15, 20 years have said to us about music practice is that it has to be frequent. You can't just practice once a month. Lots and lots of frequent practice. 
But the really big thing that people know about music practice is it has to be deliberate. You have to do it with your brain switched on. You can't just play the same thing over and over again. Now I stand there in front of my music stand with my viola. Playing the same thing again and again doesn't do it. What does it is having your brain engaged, having your actual brain working out what you're doing. One of, one of, my, um, one of the people I interviewed when I did a talk about this, she said, you have to concentrate, you have to monitor what you're doing, working out exactly what you sound like, because your brain is working. Um, what a lot of my music practice um, experts tell me is that good music practice is small, not an hour's practice, but five minutes practice, intense and deliberate, is worth more than an hour's rather unfocused, sloppy practice. Um, and, and, and something that comes through again and again and again is, is that really good music practice is about problem solving. <coughs> that if you just play something you don't get very far. There was a little study uh, done in Texas where they got a number of uh, people to learn a, a particularly difficult piece by Shostakovich, Piano Prelude. And then they let them play these, these were all student, music students, and they let them play these pieces in the afternoon to see who got them best, who got it best. They had video cameras watching how they practiced in the morning. And the ones who did best were not the people who'd spent the most time. They were the people who actually, when they got to a problem in the music, they solved the problem. They worked out how to solve the problem before moving on to the next stage. The problem solving is the thing that actually makes practice work for music. Now, all of those things may have relevance for us as uh, language teachers. And maybe George's 10 in the bed repetition may have had these qualities or it may not. But I wonder if you'll agree with me that, that now I've got to where I know where I'm going. I wonder if you'll agree with me now uh, that this little activity does satisfy these criteria. Um, so, for example, this is a typical uh, word cloud. You're familiar with these. And if I tell you that all of these words come from the same text, can anyone here hazard a guess what it might be? And what it might be about, more to the point. Those of you watching uh, abroad, there is a, 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 a mood of deep thought. In this <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the people with their eyes closed, obviously. They're, they're, they're just... anyone, anyone got an idea? What do you think the topic of this is? Uh, winter? It's kind of staring you in the face. Dreams. 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 Thank you very much. Yes. A poem? I think it could well be a poem. Of course it is a poem. Uh, does anyone know this poem? It's a short poem. You might know it's an American poem by one of the great... Uh, poets, uh, okay, so here it goes. Uh, um, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Now, my suggestion for a perfect repetition lesson is to do that wordle, make sure that every one of my students, and I can use this very pretty low level that everyone in my class understands every single word. And what I'll do with them is I'll get them to read this poem and think about it. And then I'll ask if anyone wants to say anything about the poem. And if they don't, well, they don't. And then I'll say, I'd like you to read through the poem under your breath. I'd like you to speak the poem. Not out loud, but just I'd like you to speak the poem in your mind, in your mind's eye. I think you talk about this, Adrian, quite often. The idea of some of the best pronunciation practice students ever do is silent pronunciation practice in their own heads, in their own brain. So doing that, and then when they've done that, I'd like to say, okay, now, dear students, I'd like you to have a murmur, have a mumble, or murmur, whatever you call it. Mum mumble this poem, murmur this poem, and so you get a kind of around the class. Then probably we'll get students to listen to someone speaking it well. And then they can underline or circle the stressed words or the words or put in little marks for where the pauses are, something like that. And when they've done that, then maybe we'll do, we'll do uh, because I've had to transfer from Kino to, to PowerPoint, we've lost some of the, um, what do you call it? Uh, animation. animation of this. Um, we'll, do, we'll do this kind of thing, you know, the, the, the disappearing dialogue thing. 
So then we do disappearing dialogues and we gradually wipe out words so that students learn this poem. And they learn it uh, and, then they, and then it gets even, they learn it and learn it and learn it. start to speak it. And each time a student speaks it, maybe practicing in pairs, working with each other in pairs, each time they do it in pairs, their colleague or the group, if they're in little trios, each, or their colleagues, each time they make suggestions about how to say it best. For example, where would you put a pause? Where would you put a pause? I think I think the, the penultimate two, li the two last lines are rather beautiful. Um, life is a barren field, frozen. No. Now that pause really gives that a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of uh, bite, a little bit of kick. And so it seems to me that 256 years after Georgie Raman did There Were Ten in the Bed, or however many years it is, I think she was onto something, and repetition is onto something. I think I happen to think, as it happened, that getting students to learn poetry by heart and learn how to say it concentrating, deliberately solving the problem of how to say it, doing it frequently, and then standing up in front of the class and speaking with confidence might very well be a way that repetition, pure, undiluted repetition, still has a function today. For, you see, it seems to me that we spend an awful lot of our time provoking student failure. Let me give you an example. Good morning, class. Open your books at page 26. Look at the text. Read the first sentence. And he reads the first sentence, and you know what happens? He reads it badly, because he's never seen it before. You know what else happens? He knows he's reading it badly. And you know what else happens? Everyone else in the class knows he's reading it badly too. And yet, all over the world, for the last 2,000 years, at this very minute, a teacher in some classroom in the world is saying, good morning class, or good afternoon class, open your books. Open your books on page 26, look at the text, read the first sentence. Provoking failure, provoking, provoking... By the way, I'm a huge fan of reading aloud, but not like that. What do we do uh, to go back to Claire Cramps? We say to dear, dear students, um, so I'd like you now to think about the situation, um, uh, oh God, uh, the, the, the contemporary situation, uh, global warming, global warming. Um, what do you think about global warming, says a teacher to a student. And the student has to try and think of something to say about global warming in a language they don't speak very well. And you know what happens? They screw up. And this is, I'm not sure how big a point this is, but my slight concern is that by provoking failure, we undermine students' confidence in the class. Whereas, by getting students to be able to understand, learn, and speak that <coughs> poem well and beautifully is just a huge achievement, and they can do it with confidence and with pride. So that's my little story about repetition. Uh, and um, I've probably run over time. I've no idea what the time is, but no one's been sort of making... And I, th I think this is the question thing. I'm not sure where, um, we can, uh, how we'll get questions from uh, our participants outside this room. Is there anybody... Yeah, I'm questions? watching the stream. You are. Will you, will you read them out or...? Can do. Um, I think I can't think of any other way of doing it. I can assume that it's here on the screen. Um, any likely question there? Not yet. There's a lot of discussion about uh, whether Jeremy's actually uh, right or not. <laughs> Don't read that out. <laughs> Although one comment does say that you're very wise there, dear Jeremy. Crumb of the pig. Are there any questions in the room? Yes. Thank you. Do you think it matters what? Hang on a minute. You have to ask it on mic, of course, for it to go out to the sharing with our made a very powerful case for drilling. Do you think it makes a difference what is drilled? Uh, by the, I absolutely do. Um, the, you know, Scott made this really good point in his dogma talk a little bit earlier about, uh, and again, I, I can't remember his words, but it's about how if the student has bought into what it is they're saying, 
then, then the whole thing is deeper and much more profound. Uh, I think getting students to endlessly report the repeat fairly meaningless grammar sentences is probably uh, less successful than getting them to repeat things that they care about. So my little um, slightly tongue-in-cheek but also heartfelt suggestion that poetry is a way of, of provoking you know, good repetition depends on the teacher being able to engage the students with the poem. It depends on them actually buying in emotionally to the poem, to the words of the poem, and wanting to do it. Because I, because I, I think um, when I've taught before and, and looked at some of the old-fashioned, old-fashioned, uh, looked at some of the teaching materials from Akel Entonces from the 1970s, 1980s, one of the criticisms about some of the stuff that te the students were asked to repeat is it doesn't have enough heart. Someone said in, in a session I was running the other day, not enough heart, which is my absolute response to, to what you're saying. It has to have heart, doesn't it? And then I think it's going to be powerful. Utterances repeated are also utterances re-signified, but you don't give any, you don't get new meaning if there's no heart. Um, what poets do you recommend? <laughs> Um, can you repeat the question back? Yes, the question was, what poets do you recommend? Uh, by the way, that's a really good question. I've, I've, got, I've got a few, and I'll rattle off some names. But, but the most important thing, I went to a fantastic session on using poetry at the Mexican Soul uh, Convention in Querétaro two weeks ago. Um, and it was beautifully done, and I can't remember the, the speaker, but one of the poems he, he chose um, uh, was a, that, you know, uh, uh, is it Margaret, are you grieving for golden... Glade, I'm leaving. Um, the John Manny Hopkins poem. Hopkins. Hopkins, isn't it? Um, hello, Mark. It's uh, Hopkins' poem. And, 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 and I, I thought listening to that, that that's a poem I wouldn't use because it's, because it's quite an old idiom and you have to, the syntax of it and the commas and stuff really don't work. But this kind of Langston Hughes poem, I'd use that. Um, some of some people like people like Roger McGough. Some of his poems are really useful. Some of Caroline Duffy's poems are absolutely beautiful. Um, I use, uh, uh, for example, uh, there's a poem by E. Cummings I use, which which is a perfect one for getting students to work out how to speak it. Do you know that poem? It may not always be so, but I say that if your lips, which I have loved, should touch another's, and your dear strong fingers clutch his heart as mine in time not right. It's the most beautiful poem, and it it's a basically it has to be a poem whose meaning is, is uh, retrievable without, uh, f okay, sorry, okay. my belief for as a language teacher is it has to be a poem whose meaning is retrievable without kind of two months study. In a, so I find a lot of late 20th century, uh, 21st century poems, not hugely long, uh, work really, really well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, lots and lots of work. But, it, but, it, but, you know, the, the Langston Hughes poem we just looked at, I chose specifically because it must have been clear to you that that poem is very, the meaning is very clearly and obviously recoverable uh, instantly in that poem. Somebody said, you think, can you do the same sort of thing with song lyrics? Uh, uh, yes, you could do. Question. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, Sean has just quite uh, rightly told me off for not repeating the question for those of you who are watching online. Being told off by Sean is kind of an occupational hazard, really. But, um, but <laughs> it's true. But actually, goes back years, doesn't it? <laughs> goes back years. Um, uh, the, the question is: the question is, is what do I believe what I'm saying to be equally plausible for song lyrics? And my kind of answer is yes and no. Uh, the point about song lyrics is they're songs, and so although they have tremendous contemporary relevance and may exactly to to answer your question again have the heart that you need to repeat. They don't necessarily have the kind of speaking rhythm and, and patterns that you might want to associate. However, um, getting um, students to sing, uh, now this sounds really corny, but one of my students uh, at the new school in New York, one of my online students, MA students, um, uh, told she's, she's just come back from teaching in Korea. And although she is at least 35 or more years younger than me, she described in a, in a discussion post how she had taken her guitar into the class and she had, um, she had sung that, that totally contemporary and up-to-date modern classic called Blowing in the Wind with her students. And she described 
what a success it had been. Because the students sang it and engaged in the singing of it with a huge passion, the heart. And they repeated it again and again and again because they wanted to sing it better and better and better. And I suppose that makes the argument in a sense that, that you know, utterances or song lyrics repeated are also utterances song lyrics re-signify. And, and I can't believe that the students will have lost anything from that repetition. There's a question going, a uh, debate going on online, really. Um, ben asked the question, he, he says he likes the idea of repetition, however poetry is not usually written in the natural everyday language. Is it useful for students to commit this sort of material to mastery? Um, uh, I, that sort of ties in very much with the question about what kind of poems did you use. Uh, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when its alteration finds. No, students don't have to say that kind of thing. For a start off, it was written in the, in the 16th century. It doesn't make much sense. But, but modern poetry does sound good uh, in, in a spoken way. And, the, and uh, if you choose the right poems, and if students have to concentrate on how to say it well so that it gets over the meaning and it sounds good, does it help them to be fluent, uh, natural conversationalists? I don't know. But what I do know is that one of the chief... Um, I went to a wonderful talk at uh, Tisal Arabia about three years ago, and there was a guy from the University of Sydney, which, as you know, is in Canada. It really is in Canada, by the way. So it's in Canada. And he gave this wonderful talk about what happens when you try and speak a foreign language. He said, you spend your... Do you remember it, Gavin? You were there, yeah, weren't you? Excellent this, talk. It, excellent talk. And, the, and the lamp post thing. The, the, the chevrons right, on the road. Chevron. And he also had this thing, a bit like a streetcar named Desire. He said, you know, whenever you try and speak in a foreign language, you, you exist somewhere on a climb between fear and desire. The tremendous fear that you're going to screw up and make a fool of yourself. Uh, and, but a huge desire to communicate. You want to communicate. And, and depending on where you are on that climb, depends on your sort of success or failure or your, your ability to try it out. Now, my argument for the poems, my, my argument for that questioner who says, are poems really the things we should be getting students to do? is that what I've just described, at the very least, I think actually it'll teach students a lot about how to say things so they mean something. But what it does give is confidence, because if you can stand up in a foreign language, if you can stand up, if, if I could stand up in Spanish and say here in Spanish some beautiful poems so that you all wept with, with, with emotion, boy, that would make me feel good. That would give me huge confidence, you know? Uh, so, so I. There was a guy called Colin White in Mexico who used to used to get his beginner students to learn the romantic poem poets by heart, um, but he was a bit of a maverick. Uh, but but um, I just think that if you can stand up and speak like that in a foreign language, doesn't it make you feel good? And you maybe you move a little bit further down the climb, and desire begins to take over. interesting to see how techniques that were introduced so many years ago in the International House are still relevant.